Forecast 4, the most accurate forecast. Fine and cool overnight, the low 5 Celsius, that's 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Later today, sunny at first, with rain spreading from the southwest later in the day. Slightly warmer, maximum temperature 19 Celsius, 66 degrees Fahrenheit. The outlook for Wednesday and Thursday, warmer with occasional rain. Temperature now, 8 Celsius, 46 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Line on Beacon and WABC. It's a free for all, so you can talk about anything you want to talk about. 754123 in Wolverhampton or 236235 in Shrewsbury. Those are the exclusive numbers which get you onto this show. If you've often wondered, we well, probably have in your, your lighter moments, sat there with nothing else to do, thinking, I wonder how you actually get onto that show. Well, what you do is you give us a call. The, uh, the lovely James is answering the calls this morning. Um, he'll answer your call, take your number, whoops, give you a call back. And next thing you know, you're cruising the airwaves on Beacon and WABC. It's that simple. That's how you do it. OK, so 754-123 in Wolverhampton, 236-235 in Shrewsbury. And if you are, by chance, a first-time caller, then all you've got to do is say, hey, guess what? I'm a first-time caller. And magic things happen. In Because I have a magic chair. What a sad old man Jimmy Savile is, eh? got to watch what he says, because he works here on a Sunday. But um, he thinks he's got a magic chair. And nobody's sort of had the guts to tell him yet. Now then you'll see my magic chair. Starts with magic chairs, ends up with you standing at bus stops, wearing fluffy carpet slippers and not remembering why you're there. That's where it starts. Okie dokie. It's a free-for-all so you can talk about anything you want to talk about. If you've got any moans, the moan line is well and truly open. I declare this moan line well and truly open so you can have a moan. Uh, especially about the council. The council have been behaving themselves. If they haven't, then we'd like to hear what they've been up to. Have you got any insurance gripes? Because I actually combated two. I've got, uh, current score is Perry 2, insurance company's nil. Because a couple of people phoned up and said, Oi, we've got problems with an insurance company. And it's not fair. And it's gone on for years and years and years and years and years. Or at least months. I was exaggerating slightly. So I got stuck in. And uh, we won. Because they don't like they oh they don't like it up them they really don't like it so yeah if you've got any gripes about insurance companies about the council you can give us a call uh, any of the subjects that we talked about last week you can resurrect this week if you couldn't get through and sat there stamping your little feet and getting all jolly upset about things because you couldn't get through no worries on Friday we talked about well it was a free for all actually but we talked about what what did women find sexy you know. S E X. Can you talk about sex after twelve? Oh yes. So we asked what women found sex in bottoms seemed to be the um, seem to be the most prevalent answer. Anyway, talk about what you want to talk about. Seven five four one two three in Wolverhampton, two three six two three five in Shrewsbury. If the reports are right, tough luck, Manchester. There we go. Where would you rather go, Moss Side or Australia? I know where I'd rather go. Holden Road. Hi Ian, what a plank I felt when you read my letter out Thursday night and found out you only had half of it. I don't know what my son Jason is going to think when he reads the other half in Tenerife. I realised what I'd done after I posted the letters. I tried to ring the station to tell you what I'd done but couldn't get through. So when you read it out, I... rang again and left a message to tell you. I was a little shocked when you said my address didn't ring a bell. Seeing as I've written so often, well, heaps of people do. I thought the address would be embedded in your mind, ha ha. Well, I've only got a little mind. Anyway, I'm asking you to put me out of my misery and put a face to your voice. It's driving me crazy trying to imagine what you look like. Pretty damn ugly. And he promised me at least it doesn't. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, Paul Quinney, all right, all right. See what we can find for you. All right, all right. God, some people. Oh, fabulous. My competition is well and truly open. We've got lots of entries. Well, unfortunately, they're in my other leather jacket. Never mind. For the, uh, the very naughty word just passed my mind and automatically got censored. Uh, tacky postcard competition. <laughs> and here's another entry. And this one is from Claire Ruston. And it is Her Majesty the Queen Mother. It's a postcard of Her Majesty the Queen Mother. I'm very good for me age, you know. Shame about the teeth. Those gates were awful. What a waste of money. Anyway, it says, Dear Ian, another postcard to add to your boring collection. I hope it's not too exciting for you to cope with. Love from Claire Ruston in St. Peter's Close. Uh, in answer to your question, Claire, it's still in the camera. 
Regarding Thursday night's topic, my idea of sexy is longish hair, not a girly face, because that was the big debate, whether or not girly-looking blokes were sexy or not. Um, Claire says no, they're not. Long hair, there we go, we can do that. Girly, not a girly face, definitely put that one on for you. And a dead sexy voice, just like a lot of people say you have. You're very kind. Okay, what we want you to do is to send you tacky postcards. Um, basically, the crapper the better. We want really mind-bogglingly dull and boring ones. If you can send us those to 267 Tetanal Road in Wolverhampton or 28 Castle Street in Shrewsbury, what we'll do at the end of the summer, whenever we deem that to be, probably a week on Wednesday, judging by today's weather, then we'll get the captain, that well-known epitome of good taste, to judge which one is the worst. And the worst postcard that I get sent, the tackiest, the nastiest, the crappest, gets your own, your very own, Culture Lovers Do It At Midnight t-shirt. And it's exclusive because there's only going to be six made. I'm getting one, so that leaves five um, to be won. That's how you can win one of them. Noddy in Stuart Road writes, Dear Ian, I was listening to the subject of violence on Wednesday the 7th of July. That was one of the subjects we covered last week. Uh, violence in relationships and also violence towards children and whether or not either could ever be justified. I heard about the chap who apparently slapped his wife or girlfriend. I reckon a chap of his, if a chap of his own age was to hit him, he'd run a mile. Another thing is a slap will soon become punches and kicks. If I hit a wench, if I hit a wench, I would feel guilty and ashamed to show my face in the street again. Bye for now, that's from Noddy. Okay, Noddy, thanks for that. Not oh, Noddy, he used to sing with the finest rock and roll band the world has ever known, surely? No, got to be another Noddy. Okie dokie. Midnight line, three till two, then from two till three, it's the hits and the headlines, three till four, we'll probably have a fantastic new competition for you, uh, assuming that I can think of one between then and now. Four o'clock, my pal out, right the way through till six. Okie dokie, let's go to the lines, it's a free for all, 754-123 in Wolverhampton, 236-235 in Shrewsbury. Good morning, Mr. Wingnut. Ha ha! Ha ha to you. Ha ha ha, it's me. Ha ha ha. When's this show get back to normal? Now. Good. Today, for a That's week. That's what I wanted to moan about. Only for a week. Only for a week? Yeah, then then two weeks um, I'm doing something else. <sighs> but still the Midnight Line. Midnight Line's going to be the right the way through. Well, the ratings are out soon, so assuming that the Midnight Line's ratings are OK, the Midnight Line's going to be there all the way through. Well, I don't just mean the Midnight Line. I mean all of it all night. All of it all night? Yeah. This week. Back to normal this week. Special yes, uh, exclusive get offer. Bit to get his house in order. I'm uh, saying it. And we did it because we Thank need... you to James because he does such a good job, that lad does. And uh, nobody mentioned him. I did. Oh, I did as well. I just did. Have you? It's not very nice, is it? What? It's not a very nice thing to come on and say, is it? Well, thank you to James. The, no, that I don't mention him. No, no, I said nobody mentioned do. him. Other people I was on about, not you. And, and I do mention him. Sorry. It's okay. You get it right. Where thank was you. you today? Um, I went around to Eric's today. What time? Uh, after you. He was late. No, I wasn't. No, no, I said I would get there as close to 10 o'clock as I could, and I did. Uh, which 10 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> Got you. <ya. laughs> Got me, yes. Got you. Go on, tell everybody why you went round to Eric's today. Why did I go round to Eric's today? Yes. Take him some goodies. You some, did? Some bread and cakes. Keep him company for a couple of hours and to meet you there at the same time. However... However, two out of three ain't bad. Two out of three ain't bad. As Meatloaf used to say. And I went round to Eric's today because regular listeners to the show will have heard a couple of weeks ago that Eric had his lighter nicked. So what I did was, as I have no no use for lighters anymore, I took my um, what do you call them? Those really posh American jobs. More than the more. No more more. What? Put your teeth in. No 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 no. The um, Zippo. Oh. Zippo lighter. So Eric's got a lighter again. And we also took uh, £25 round from Ken Clark because he sent us £25. So yes. I took that and you took him some bread. So he's a happy little panda. And some cakeies. And some cakeies. Did you get your stuff all right? I did, yeah. You, you, you left some um, bread for me. Yes. And it was absolutely delicious. I can recommend um, Lynn's Bakery bread to the world. Thank you. It's quite all right. I've got a new friend. Does this. <laughs> well, George not... Spider. Oh, you've got one? I've got a new one. Pet Spider. I call him George, but I call him Gorgeous George because he's very good looking. He's a bit like Richard Gere. He's a second cousin, twice removed, to my old mate Harry. Harry the Spider. Harry the Spider, who got squished. I wonder if he's any relation to my ex-Spider, Boris. He might well be. Could be. Ask him. How do you look after George. your spider? I, I uh, squish a few flies at home and bring them in for him. You're a very kind man, aren't you? You've got to, you've got to look after them, haven't you? You do. I mean, they're here to keep you company. 
they look after you, they keep you smiling. Well, I mean, left to their own devices, spiders... George wanted me to tell you how yes. I came to call Harry, Harry. How did you come to, to call Harry, Harry? Well, what it was... Fascinate he, the globe, why don't been, you? He'd been with me a couple of hours, the first night he'd been with me, and he was sat on top of the door. I had to shut the door, very fast, because of the my, my door was skinning over and what have you. And as I shut the door, fortunately for Harry, he managed to jump out of the way very quick. But, unfortunately, he got his wobbly bit caught in the hinge of the door. A spider's wobbly bit? Yes. So I was Probably going, the uh, most sensitive part of a spider's anatomy. Very, very. So I had to call him when Harry got his Hampton cord. <laughs> Harry for short. <laughs> very good, that. Yes, and that's how I come to name him Harry. H, my old friend H. But, uh, and my gaffer squished him after four days. So I was very, very, very downhearted. But you've got a pet replacement. But I've got a pet replacement. Well, left, left to their own devices and given the freedom of the house to run around, spiders make absolutely excellent pets. Well, he's here, he's here now. He isn't here at the moment, but he's, he's been popping, he keeps popping in and out. I've got one, I, I do actually now still have a, a pet spider and it lives in the garage. Ah, well, I haven't got a garage. We've got a shed. And it's called Rambo. Ah. Because of the size of the thing. It was size 8 Dot Martins <laughs> and weight trains. Well, we don't, we don't get any of that. Is 9 o'clock every morning, show you. Can we do weight training? No, no, no. Yeah, it's a question. I saw, first time I saw it, it was a question of who was going to throw who out, you know? <laughs> so, I send our love to your spider. Many thanks for going around to Eric. You're a very kind man. Sorry I missed you. He lied. All right. I, shall, uh... I was actually hiding in the hedge waiting for you to go. It probably was. <laughs> I, think, I think it's because you didn't want me to tell them about you rubbing the... Rubbing Honda 90 off your bike in crayon and writing Triumph on it. No, all right, that, that's fair enough. I was actually hitting the hedge with my with my Honda 90. <laughs> Can I just say good morning to There's some lads out there who listen, but they can't get to a phone. Anthony and the boys, and I hope he enjoyed himself at the guides on Saturday. Hey? And the skirt fitting. <laughs> Moving He sweet. works at the tackle shop where I get my bait from. I believe you. And they're right. always listening. They're always listening for Eric, and they're big fans of the Big E. Okie dokie then. Okay then. Speak to you soon. Keep doing it. Ta -ra. Bye. Who we got next? We got Matt. Good morning, Matt. Morning, Ian. Your surname isn't Black for any chance, is it? Uh, no. Or Emulsion? No. No. Alright, it was worth asking, wasn't it? What can we do you for? Um, I'd like to talk about these dinosaurs. Uh, now you're either talking about Jurassic Park or another lot approximately 30 miles from here. Uh, the, the latter. Ah, right, yeah, because if you wanted to talk about Jurassic Park, you'd be talking about dinosaurs that people would actually make some money out of, wouldn't you? <laughs> Yeah, which dinosaurs do you have in mind? The dinosaurs I'm having in mind are Tony Blackburn, David Hamilton and Tony Prince. Oh, the Zimmer frames. That's the yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I won't be bitchy. It's unprofessional to be bitchy. Can <laughs> I uh, mention extra AM? Well, you might as well. They need all the help they can get. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bother me. It's a bit strange. Anyway. Yes. Um, also, I want to talk about these roadworks. Well, hold on a minute. popping up all over the place. So you start off with Tony Blackburn. Yeah. Now, a local radio station which purports to be local to the Birmingham area has employed the services of three dinosaurs. Tony Blackburn, who? Who's the other one, Tony? Um, Tony Prince. Have you ever heard of him? Um, no. No, me neither. <laughs> so anyway, great decision. And uh, some other geriatric that they got out of retirement from somewhere. Now, is that purporting to be a local radio station? Uh, yes. Because there's nothing very local about them, really, is there? Um, well, I don't know. We're actually stationed. Let, let me ask you, as a consumer mm -hmm. of radio-type products, would you would that be a big enough draw to get you to listen? Uh, no. No, me neither. No. Uh, in fact, probably quite the opposite. <laughs> I remember Blackburn from the 70s, and he was crap then. Anyway, yes, Roadworks. <laughs> That's bitchy! I thought you said you weren't going to be bitchy, then you're, gonna go, you're being bitchy. Sorry. Um, Slap for that. You're right. You're right. Sorry, St. Tony. Anyway. Roadworks. Is Roadworks. This, a, is this the one where cones mate? That's what I was going to say. Mm, they do, don't they? They do. They sort of multiply. I'm sure that... Uh, <coughs> we probably only started off with two rogue cones, right? But they mate during the night, and those two become ten. Because how else would you explain just... just heaps of road cones that, that move almost randomly around the motorway network? And they must move themselves, because I've never seen anybody doing any work behind them, have you? No, not really. I mean, why is it you, you sit in a traffic jam for 35, 40, sometimes 50 minutes, moving at one mile an hour, and then finally you get to the roadworks, you get to the coned-off area, and what do you see? What do you see there? 
No, nothing. Nothing! Absolutely right! Nothing! Not even! They don't even have the decency to pay somebody to lean on a shovel having a fag. With a bit of bum cleavage showing. Anything. Anything. You know, just uh, or, or just put a workman's hut with some workman painted on it. I don't care. Just give me some justification for the 40 minutes I've just spent riding at one mile an hour. They never do it, do they? It's not just me and it's not just you. They never do anything. Wh which road works did you have in mind? Oh, well, I uh, well, the place, aren't they? Yeah, uh, but, it, but it, it's nothing to do with road works. It's, it, it's hordes of cones randomly, randomly um, striding through the area after dark. Because have you noticed that two days later they've gone? Only yes. to reappear somewhere they, else. Yes, they do. Yes. Some have flashing light on top as well. Ah, those are the new mutations. Yes. Yes, they were the ones who went to Chernobyl for the holidays <laughs> and came back with flashing blue lights on top. Those are the ones. You're right, I blame the government. And me. All right, then. <laughs> OK. Cheers. Thank you, Ian. Ta. Bye. There we go. That was... Oh, he was a first-time caller as well. That was Matt on Beacon and WABC's Midnight Line. 754 123 in Wolverhampton, 236 235 in Shrewsbury. Who have we got next? We've got Vicky next. Good morning, Vicky. Hello, Ian. How's oh. Trix? Hey, uh, Trix who? Oh, Trix. Oh, that's yes, it. It's a conventional sir. sort of greeting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, hey, it's, it's fine. It's supposed to mean, hello, how are you? Fine, Vix, no nicks. <laughs> How no, do you know what I'm not wearing? Hey, ooh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, Roadworks. Yes. It's not just the Roadworks set, right? It's that plastic cable company's at it again. Which one would that be? Cable. Cable TV. Oh, does anybody actually watch that? Well, I'm not having it to my ass. There's no point digging up my pavement because I'm not having it. What exactly is the point of digging up the pavement when, if you really want it, you can just buy yourself a satellite dish? Well, I don't know, but I said to them, can't you just reopen the potholes that were dug before us instead of putting new ones in? He said, no, he couldn't. No, you can't do it like that. Demarcation, isn't it? Someone <laughs> else has dug them. That's what that is. Yeah. So you're not going to be one of the, t they call it take-ups. Oh, well, I'm not fed up of it. I mean, everywhere I live, there's roadworks and cable companies sticking up in front of my house and things like that. And I'm... Do you think we're ever going to achieve the uh, day where the world looks perfect, Britain looks perfect, and all the roadworks and so forth are finished? Oh, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? Because presumably they're there for a purpose. Well, I don't know. H have you found a purpose to roadworks yet? Well, I haven't found a purpose for life yet. Oh, you are doing badly, aren't you, dear? Yeah, I reckon, I reckon um, probably isolating and understanding the meaning of the existence of the universe is probably a lot easier to understand than why roadworks exist. Oh. I've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as well. Why do they... Oh, brilliant brilliant book. And there's a fifth one out. Is there? There's a fifth book in the trilogy. Oh, brilliant. So brilliant. You, can, you can now enjoy all five of the uh, trilogy. Which I always thought meant three, but anyway, there you go. The wild guy, Douglas Adams. So, uh, you wanted to talk about single parents, though, didn't you? Yeah, because I am one. You are one. Are you one of these very fat people with 18 kids? Well, I'm a bit on the plump side, but I haven't got 18 kids. Oh, you see, them, you see them all over. I know exactly what single parents look like because I've seen them on the telly. Have you? This is where they've been interviewed by news people. Mm -hmm. And single parents are female, yeah. right, because they're never male. Yeah. Um, they're very fat, mm -hmm. very ugly looking, mm -hmm. very greasy looking. They've yeah. all got 14 kids. Yeah. And they say things like, oh, do you deserve to be kept by the state? Hmm. Well, I'm a little on the plump side, dear, but I haven't got 14 kids. I've only got two. And I don't think I scrub up half that bad, so it's not an accurate description of me. And I, I don't think it's an accurate description of anybody, is it? <laughs> I think if you want to look for bias in the news media, I think you've got to look there. Well, I mean, I was getting a little bit, you know, peed off at it because I didn't get pregnant to have a to, so I could jump the council housing listing. I the did. Council house. I did. That's oh, precisely you're a medical what. Miracle, are yes, you? I am. No, seriously though, dear. Seriously though, I'm a bit fed up with it because they're. So I am serious. Me. What do you think this is? <laughs> Oh, you're not in a discussion mood tonight, are you? I am, I am, I am. Mood, aren't you? The, uh, the fetus just stated in a box. <laughs> oh, what am I going to do with you? You're a total deadlock. Sorry, I, what I was, the, the point I was trying to make was yeah. that um, as far as the news bulletins I've seen on the controversy that's currently surrounding single parents, the coverage has been exceptionally biased. Yes. And give it, given all the God-fearing moral majority of the United Kingdom a very biased idea about what constitutes a single parent, but worse still, what constitutes a, a biased opinion as to what constitutes society's um, obligations towards single parents. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, the thing is, though, if half these um, single parents, the fathers of their children, got off that button and maintained them, there wouldn't be um, the need for them to rely on the state as much. Did you know... I was watching a programme before on workhouses. You weren't, were you? Yeah, it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And they were all about workhouses in Birmingham. And 
the the guy who used to be the the sort of prison governor, except he didn't call himself that. He was um, commenting that I think it was about sixty years ago or so. There was actually a law passed where if you had a child and you couldn't afford to bring it up, so having having a child without the necessary means to bring it up could be taken into consideration as an indicator that you were feeble-minded. Yeah, and you know that if you were illegitimate and you yourself had an illegitimate child, that was um, thought of as um, inherited feeble-mindedness. That's a bit of a... but never mind what that is. Um, well, our, our, we don't seem to have moved that much, really, do we, in 60, 70 years? Well, I think society as a whole has got it wrong. I mean, stop blaming single parents and take a look in your own back the yard, mate. That's what I say. Um, there seems to be an attitude these days that it's quite all right to... <clears throat> Have a child with a woman or a girl, whichever your preferences are. And well, not if you're trying to everyone with a dog, they'll lock you up. <laughs> yeah, they still do lock you up for that. No, the thing is, though, it seems to be that, you know, lads, the, some people, some men these days seem to think it's all right to get a girl pregnant and leg it um, and not maintain, maintain that child, like what my ex-husband did. Well, so he got you pregnant and legged it? Well, twice, and then he decided hey. that... <laughs> well, he obviously couldn't have gone very far. <laughs> Well, I was, well, I was married for five years, and um, when the children came along, he took one look at the responsibilities they entailed, and he was off like a um, rat like out of a, a drain. Like a whippet. Precisely, yeah. Rat out of a drain pipe. Yeah, so we did hear hide no hair of him again. So he left you with two children? That's right, yeah, yeah. Now, why aren't they his responsibility? Because he's decided, seeing as he was a selfish individual, I better not go on my line the dead, that... Um, oh, is he? Yes, he did. Oh, dear. He died. Well, like, as you can imagine, I was absolutely grief-stricken. But that's, that's another story. Did you have any, any, I bet you were grease sticking. Didn't you have the insurance policies paid up? No, I didn't do it. Mm. That's what, anyway, well, he obviously, he decided that um, as he couldn't handle parenthood and family life, that he would just start leg it up to the um, the big smoke. And that's, that's where he, he died in London. But I, I still, you know, fervently maintain that the absent parent, because it's not always men that go, it's sometimes women, they um, ought to be made to maintain their offspring now, perhaps they wouldn't have quite so many of them. Because it does seem very one-sided who, who takes the responsibility, doesn't it? I've only known one bloke who actually fought and got custody of his son, of his girlfriend, and that, you know, that's it. <laughs> one bloke? Yeah, one bloke, and all, all the time I've been doing the single parent bit, so to speak. Now, hang on a minute, two. Sorry, I'm being inaccurate there. Two, two fellas have known, um, actually taken on the responsibility of bringing up the children. When you're a single parent, what responsibility do you believe the rest of society has to you? Well, um, and why? Yeah, it's a bit difficult, that one. I mean, some women can cope with going out to work and running a home and family. And if they can do that, that's fine. But there's some women who just can't take it. I mean, the whole pressure just sort of, um, you know, everything goes to pot. It's um, very difficult for society in a whole, but I definitely think they ought to make it easier for single mothers to get out to work. I mean, at the moment, you get no relief on the cost of childcare at all. And if the government, which is so so concerned about its purse and the way it seems to be emptying frequently, if they actually did something constructive, like in the way of childminding vouchers. But then if you do that, don't you encourage one-parent families? Well, they're saying you encourage them at the moment by um, putting um, pregnant girls to the top of the council waiting list, don't they? Should, the they, should they do that? Situation. Well, I mean, it's a catch-22 situation again. It's the way society's gone. I mean, I, I haven't got all the answers. I can only sit here and struggle on my own little particular way. But I know that if there was some way that um, single parents could get relief for the cost of childminders, that most single parents would go out to work, thereby relieving the, the state of a burden. Um, and I remember a couple of years ago, the, this question was put to, you know, them upstairs in Whitehall, one of the ministers, I forget who it was, and he said that the reason that they didn't want relief on the cost of childcare for single parents is they actually wanted them to stay at home and look after their children. They thought the children were better off with mums at home. I don't believe that. Oh, I do. He said it on TV. I was so angry they put my foot through the box. But I know a lot of single... You didn't believe it either, really, did you? <laughs> well, I don't know what I believe, darling. I think a politician is, a, is an animal with um, a very thick skin. How do you know if a politician's lying? He goes bright red. No, his mouth moves. <laughs> That's simple. That's how simple it is. I mean, I can understand people getting annoyed, thinking, oh, well, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're giving these girls houses and we're having to take responsibility for their children and things like that. But it's the way the state's gone. It's a sort of state 
thing used to stem these days. The state takes. Because I honestly, I honestly, I honestly, I honestly don't believe that my tax money should be used to subsidise, in certain cases, other people having children. Well, I'd love to get out to work. If you could find me an employee that would pay me enough to um, meet all my expenses, I'd be out there tomorrow. No, I, I said in certain cases. I mean, mm -hmm. even even two parent families. I mean, how often do you go around the supermarket and see uh, sort of? A husband and wife, if you can call them that, blobbing around with 16 kids in tow. Mm, that's true. Why that's am I true. paying for that? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely don't want to have any more children, apart from the fact if I did, it would be in second um, immaculate conception. But <laughs> we'll keep speaking, an eye on you, then. Yes, no, seriously, though, I mean, I've got two children. I don't see nothing this day and age, I think. And I think people that want to go around having children by the, the dozen, it's, well, it's fine if they can support them. But if they can't, forget it. That as well. That's what I think. If they, if they, if you can't afford it, roll over and go to sleep. <laughs> All right then. Gotta move on, Vicky. Oh, do I have to? Yeah. I do so enjoy chatting. And with me you. to you, Vicky. But time and tide and no man and tempest is still fugiting. All right. Love to Eric. To that. We've got. Who we got next? We got Murray. Can't say Murray to save me life. Good morning, Murray. Hi there. Hello. Let's turn you up. Let's tweet you. You're a first time caller, Murray. Pardon? Yes, I'm a first-time caller. And surprise, how easy it was to get on, I'm sure. Well, I just crossed my fingers, pressed all the buttons, and something happened, and I got you. <laughs> yeah, tough. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to ask you is, what's your opinion of this idea of a man who's committed a murder, and I'm speaking basically of Michael Sams, but this applies in any case, and for whatever reason, they can sentence him to four life sentences. How can he serve it? How is there any justice in saying, well, we're going to give you four life sentences? Um, I don't think there's, there is any justice. I, I suppose it, 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 it's done as a matter of principle, isn't it? It's, it's a classic case of justice being seen to be done. But, as you say, one thing that's always confused me is how somebody can go to court for any offence. And suppose they're, they're done on multiple offences. And they're given um, sentences that run... Consecut consecutively. Concurrently. Concurrently, that was yeah. the word. What's the point? Exactly. You're not paying any more for your crime. In fact, they often say, well, will you take this into consideration because you're charging me with four and I've actually done another 20. And that way you only get one sentence. But where's the point? Well, they were working out... Uh, well, I've got to admit it was the Sunday sports who were working it out, and I'm deeply ashamed to have to come here this morning and admit that I bought a copy of the Sunday sport. It was an accident, and I promised never to do it again. But they were working out that it costs over four million pounds to keep your average lifer in prison. Yeah. Four million quid! What's the point? How much is a bit of rope? Why can't we... And I mean, I'm very concerned where people are. Um, I'd help the next person if I could. But why on earth don't we go back to the old system if they've got a particular crime, such as Michael Sam's, and they should say to them, you're going to have hard labour. Well, I've said it before and I'll say it again, I'm a big fan of the Soviet gulag system. What, line them up and shoot them? Um, well, no, not quite that extreme. <laughs> but um, when the Soviets sort of decide that you're going to prison, they, they don't just send you down the road. What they do is they send you to Siberia. Yeah. And you spend sort of most of your sentence down a, down a, a salt mine with a little pickaxe. Yeah, tending to your chillbanes. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I see no reason why, should, why jail should be a soft option. No, I think it's a little bit too easy for them today and they start young enough and they get the soft treatment and they just come out and it's a bit like a club and all they want to do is to brag about it and the next time they're fitted up for it. They're, they're ready, they don't care. But as I say, coming back to this idea of some judge standing up at, uh, at um, the front of a court or sitting at the front of a court and he says, all right, you've committed X, Y, Z crimes, a life sentence which... Today seems to be about 20 years, less remission. I'm going to give you that four times over, but you're only going to serve the one period of time. It's ridiculous. Well, it's a waste of time doing it, but then I suppose it'd also be a waste of time to... Because they do that in the, in the States. You can sort of, like, get a thousand years. <laughs> which is just as meaningless, isn't it? Exactly. I think it it would probably have more an effect, more of an effect. Get your words out, Perry. It would have had more of an effect if they said we're going to send you to jail for life. And by the way, in your case, life means life. Yes, and especially when you get such as Michael Sams, he's now admitted that second murder. Now, if we'd have had the death penalty, I doubt very much he would have admitted that. 
Well, the thing is, they, they say that once you've committed murder, while uh, the death penalty was available, there was no deterrent to such, because when you, you committed one, you couldn't be hung twice. Well, they could try it, I suppose, but it wouldn't really have the desired effect. You'd only effect. get one punishment regardless. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of arguments against capital punishment, but I think there's a lot of arguments that say that we should adopt more of a harsher approach. I, I mean, I, mean I, I don't like the idea that Michael Sams is going to spend the rest of his life uh, playing pool. Exactly, and we're paying for him to be in solitary confinement with all the comforts. That's right, he's going to be segregated. Yeah. He would have to be segregated, and that, that's the ironic thing, for his own safety. Yeah. Who cares about his safety? That and child molesters, they should be hung, drawn and quartered. So you're a bit of a liberal then, are you, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it was a good idea to be hung, drawn and quartered. It made them stop and think about it, I can imagine. certainly did, especially the quartering bit. <laughs> what exactly was it? I, I understand the hung bit. Yeah. And I understand the quartering bit, because yeah. that's when they chopped well, you up into bite-sized well, pieces. Well, drawn means they, it, they were compelled to insert the sword into the abdomen and whip out the intestines and hold them up. That's your drawn business. Oh, I, I had um, I had all these visions of a government artist stood on a little... <laughs> Like Franklin. Plinth. Yeah, just stand <laughs> yeah. there, we just want to draw you. <laughs> no, I read about it. They'd, they used to drape the intestines over them. So I suppose the stupidest question of the late 15th century was, is he dead yet? <laughs> is he dead after that? Yeah. No messing around. Hey, I'll no but, messing about. I'll but fur in medieval England. Yeah. I'll but fur. OK, yeah. listen, I'm going to move on, Murray. But okay. I, I agree with you, it's, it's a total waste of time, isn't it? Thanks very much. I'll speak to you soon. Right, bye-bye. Ta-ra. 754 123 in Wolverhampton, 236 235 in Shrewsbury. It's the midnight line on Beacon and WABC. It's a free for all, so you can talk about anything you want to talk about. And we will be back to the lines after this award winning commercial break. Everybody has a special place they like to go to. I'd like to tell you about mine. It's called the Woodbridge Inn. It's in Coalport, right next to the Coalport Bridge. They've got a way of making you feel special. We often visit especially when the kids are off school. I get to enjoy some proper beers, and the rest of the family enjoy the carvery. And the kids make a big fuss, beating April and Harriet, the two resident donkeys. I've got a real soft spot for the Woodbridge Inn. Every so often, when we're feeling a bit adventurous, my wife Leslie and I, we stay over. They've got this really amazing four-poster bed. Anyway, that's my special place, the Woodbridge Inn in Colport, Telford right next to the Coalport Bridge on the River Severn. What's yours? On the phone today we have Patch from Battersea. Patch, what can I do for you? <coughs> I see, right, so you'd like to enter a greyhound race, so what's stopping you, Patch? <coughs> right, so although your legs are quite long for a Yorkshire Terrier and you've had the nodule removed, you haven't really got the build. What? I can't keep it up any longer. I did try. Huh? I did try. I'm not really Pat from Battersea. I'm what? Lord Pot Cleaner, the hairdryer repairing cabin. Oh, <laughs> very funny. It's you again, then, is it? It's you again. Well, Lord Pot Cleaner, the hair repairing cabbage, or whatever you're called, then I'm sorry there's nothing I can do for you. But a, a Cabri's boost, it's slightly rippled with a flat underside, could help you roast chestnuts with an alien disguised as a bottle of perfume. Nice. <laughs> Get off. Well, that's how I'm meant to be doing it then. 754 123 in Wolverhampton, 236 235 in Shrewsbury. It's the Midnight Line on Beacon and WABC. It's the show that your wireless was invented for. Next on the lines we've got. Got Mr. Johnny Morris. Good morning. Hello. Hello, John. How are you? I'm very, very well. How are you? Oh, I'm well. I'm great at the moment. You're great. You are. Yeah, I know. I know. I can please everybody, me. You can. Yep. What, well, what can we, we do for you this morning? We won't go into that, but um, I can please everybody. Oh yes. I've always thought. Have you now? Well, well sorry about that. Um, that and Jammer was. Jammer being your parrot. Yes. Yep. He talks to me down my ear, you know, on my shoulder. That's okay. Yeah, he's okay. Just take some aspirins yeah, and line but... a darkened room, everything will be fine. <laughs> That's okay, yeah. Well, but he's always said, like uh, I've thought, really, that pensions. Should we pay a millionaire a pension? The same as me, because I'm hard up. 
Um. That's I, hard, I, I isn't suppose it? That's hard, isn't it? I suppose yes, you do. Well, if you're going to be fair and good old fair-minded English people are always the same, you know. You pay everybody the same, don't you? I think you do, but then I suppose it's down to not the state to exercise a conscience, but down to the millionaire to exercise a conscience by saying he doesn't need it and not claiming it. You must be joking. Yeah, that's how they got to be millionaires, wasn't it? <laughs> not taking the money. That's a big laugh. So let's have a better little bit of a slant than that, please. I would. I wouldn't take it if I was a millionaire and Wait, I didn't need Ian, it. Ian, you've got... You would not. You would take it. I would it. not take it. Well, you'd be about 5% of the, of the population of millionaires. Well, I wouldn't do it, honestly. No, but, but anyway, you, you would want take it. it. You he'd would take it. it and give it to somebody that you thought you needed it. Three k. Well, by, by leaving it in the state... That's what they I'm, call power. By leaving it in the state, I'm leaving it to, uh, to somebody who needs it more than I do. Anyway, let's get over the... the would what, you take it? I certainly would. You would? I, I certainly would, and uh, I would uh, dispose of it... At my own pleasure, of course. In a pub? Um, no, I, I mean, I've got enough money to spend in a pub. I'd buy a pub, so I wouldn't have to spend any money in it, would I? You could be like a, an alcohol-related Robin Hood, couldn't you? Well, you know, if you're alcohol-inclined uh, like that, yes, certainly. Yeah, just w watch which pubs you're going were in green tights, that's all well, I'd say. Absolutely. That's my advice to you. Well, we haven't got over the problem yet. Which was? Should we pay everybody... The same pension. I think you have to if everybody's paid in. Well, doesn't that... You can't uh, say you've all paid in, but we're not paying you out. But doesn't that smack straight in the face of people that need it and people that don't need it? Yeah, but they paid, haven't they? Yes, but when I mean, I on, on that I basis, mean, if we're going to have a fair society... If you're not going to pay it out, then the millionaire is it perfectly within his rights to say, OK, well, I ain't paying in. Yes, but if you if if I said to you this is the way that the pension system has been run over the last fifty years, would you say maybe it needs changing? Does the pension system need a review? I think probably everything needs a review on a regular basis because it doesn't uh, society doesn't stand still and the needs of various elements of society don't stand still. And with answers like that, I could be a politician, really, couldn't I? You're quite good, actually. You kept me quiet for three seconds there. I, I could definitely be a politician. <laughs> me. But anyway, it's serious, this, you know. I mean, it is serious. Could we save money by not paying people that don't need a state pension, a state pension? In other words, could it go to the more needy? So and do, if, do if you that is possible, how do we do it? Well, I suppose you have to get them to sign a consent form, don't you? A means? Mm means I do not I do not want your money, thank you very much. Um, no, they won't do that, obviously. I mean, you know, people just don't say I've got money. And because, I, I mean, what you get then is people going on television and radio and saying, look, I don't need a state hand, and I get stuffed, you know what I mean? I don't need you. Yeah, but we, we can't have that, can we? Why not? Well, I mean, that would degrade the situation. What I'm trying to run is a, is a proper state pension here. I'm trying to give people that need the money the money, not the people that don't need it. What's really worrying, folks, if you're tuning in for the first time, is Johnny is actually Chancellor of the Exchequer, aren't you, John? Well, I wouldn't make... Well, I'd, I'd, I'd give it a good argument, wouldn't I? I don't know about doing the old monetary job, but how I'd would, give it a good argument. How would you do it, then? How would you realign the state pensions? Well, I would be brave to start with, and I wouldn't must mess about with it like the Tories are doing at the moment. They're trying to mute this by, you know, by saying, well, yeah, but if we didn't have to pay so many people that don't need a state pe pension, we, 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 could, we could actually pay. And they haven't said that, so I'm saying it for them. What I'm saying is there are a lot of pe more people in need than aren't in need. So I'm saying, OK, if we could get that sort of system off the ground... We could pay more money to the needed and less money to the not needed. All it needs is a system. And if that system costs the money to set it up that we're going to save by paying the people that don't need paying, well, let's set it up. Did you understand that? But then aren't you dispossessing people of what is rightfully theirs? Yes, but sometimes uh, you need to actually explain to some people that they don't need things. I mean, there are some people that don't need money, but well, just how, because how... they're going to be... Uh, if somebody come up to you and handed you a tenner, yeah. you would take it. 
Um, Where would I say anything? I'd be looking for the catch. Well, you would. Because that's the sort of chap I am. Aren't you? But most people would take it and then wait for the catch after. So we're talking about human uh, uh, behaviour, basically. Most people will take whatever's handed to them. So you reckon that you ought to disinherit a certain proportion if it can be shown Not that they don't need it? Might, That's I what mean, you're doing. Well, I think the pensions is a very old state of uh, situation. I mean, everybody's been paid a pension when they reach 60 or 65, whichever the case may be. And maybe it's been going on too long. Maybe... There's some, I'm not saying what sort of change ought to take place, but if we're going to start changing things like we're doing at the moment, a lot of things, let's start, start changing the pension as well. Okie dokie then, John. Well, I don't know what sort of, uh, uh, you know, what, what sort of reaction you're going to get from that, but I hope it's um, measured. Well, I suppose that if you looked at it logically, paying pensions to people who don't need it, you, you wouldn't, for example, pay unemployment benefit to people who don't need it, would you? Oh, like people yeah, who were working. I, I, no, don't go over the top on this. No, I'm you on, wouldn't. I, I'm on a better person reaching the age of 60 or 65. I mean, a lot of unemployed people are much younger than that. Uh, I don't want to knock the bottom end of the scale. No, I'm just, I'm just saying that, that there but are... I, you, you, only, you give it where it's needed, but don't you? But as you get older and you, you need less things in life, so you, you haven't got to spend less money, you don't go to the picture so often, you don't take women out so often... <laughs> <laughs> you know what, what I, I say mean? to that. So you, you spend less money in life. And so maybe... Uh, I, might, I don't want to upset the pensioners' uh, rights or anybody else like that. Or their lefts. Or, or their lefts, no. But you know what I mean? There's some powerful people up there. I want to say that also people, as they get older, get very rigid in their, in, in their content. Uh, and, and they may be unable to give the argument as straight as it should be. Okie dokie then, John. Okay. Many semantic backflips right. in that, and we thank Best you for it. Ta-ra. There we go. Johnny Morris saying, should we really be paying millionaires pensions? Does the Queen Mum draw her pension? That's what I want to know. Or does one of the um, one of the people what looks after with the funny wigs and the white tights, do they go down and get it for her? Okay, who's next? we got Captain Napalm next. It's Eric, and Eric is on this line here. Good morning, Eric. Eric's listening to his... Wireless, folks, but never mind because he's going to be here any second now. Good morning, Eric. This is the most famous catchphrase you will ever hear on any radio station anywhere in this cosmos, or indeed cosmos is yet to be discovered. It's the Eric. Hold on, Ian. I'm here, Ian. Hold on, Ian. I'm coming, Ian. Catchphrase. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Ian. How are you? All right. Good, you're sounding better than you did last week. Yeah. Let's turn this thing down. You turn that thing down there. If you're going to dial through to the midnight line at Beacon and WABC, and we hope you do, turn that thing down there, because we're working a six-second delay, you see. Big E. Uh, Aha. Yeah, Ian, I better than I was last week. I had a bit of kidney trouble in the throat. Kidney in the throat? Yeah. <laughs> I've got a lot of kidney trouble, haven't you? Yeah. So you feel better now? Yeah. And this is what we're all asking ourselves over the weekend. Is Captain Napalm going to be feeling better when you do? Good. Yeah. What can we uh, do for you, Eric? I have a, comp- I have a moan. Hmm? You know that light, yeah? The lighter that I gave you, yes? Yeah. What, well, you moan? Huh? You're moaning about a folks, it makes it a lot easier. So what you do is you open the top, yeah? Uh-huh. Firmly grasp the uh, rotating wheel between the thumb and the forefinger, uh-huh. yeah? And then pull it. And then all you do is you just soak the bottom bit in lighter fuel. In- reinsert it and hey presto, a perfect working lighter. Oh, but a flint? No, oh, they last forever, the one in that. The flint is situated, here we go. Once again, open the top. Uh, firmly grasp the flywheel by yeah. the index finger and thumb and pull firmly. Yeah. On the bottom of the um, the insidey bit, to use the technical term, you will see a little screw. Yeah. Undo the screw and insert the flint. Cheers. That I easy. Get... That That's easy. It, Dad. Well, it's just a thought that Zippo Light has been going since like around about 19, sort of, and so have you, so I thought you probably had one before, well, you see. I've never had one of them. Well, they're very posh ones. 
Well, well I know the gentry type, aren't they? Oh, yes. The, the Light Enforced Nine Gales, then. They do. So yeah. if, you, if you're ever on um, a trawler off Iceland in a Force Nine Gale, Eric... Um, the last petrol lighter that I had burnt all, flared out and burnt all my face. No, it's probably a cheap one, though, wasn't it? Oh, it was a cheap oh, one. All right, there you go, you see. There you are. Anyway, you... Yeah. Yes. Who else you like to complain about? No, uh, nothing else. No, right, fine, fine, fine. I just want to say this about your first caller. Yes. What was her name? Um, was it Vicky? Yeah, I think it was Vicky. <clears throat> She's got a point, you know. And I quite agree with that lady, because she has got a point. They should make men maintain their children. But it, it, is it practical to do that? It used to be years ago. How did they used to catch them, though? How did they used to get them to admit it? Oh, they'd catch them. They used to track them down. And it was... They used to, one time, have to pay seven and six for a kid. A dog licence. Seven and six a week, or...? Yeah, seven and six a week. They got to pay to that child until it was uh, 14 years of age. So why don't we track them down anymore? I don't know, because we're too interested in, uh, they're too interested in other countries, they're too interested in their own ends, they're not stopping to think of, uh, you see, they've, they've let everything run and run to the certain extent now, <coughs> about their 50 million pound, right, as they're in debt with, <coughs> excuse me, as they're in debt with, right? Right. I think so it's now they've got to start proging, they've got to start proging, they've got to start figuring out how to cut Social Security, how to cut this, how to cut that. Well, why don't they make people that stuck girls for a ride, why don't they make them pay? for the child and the maintenance of that child. They'd probably tell you that it, it would cost them more to track them down than it does just to forget about it and pay the maintenance. What about Linda Chalk has announced uh, yesterday that £18 million pounds of aid has now been earmarked for Bosnia. Is that right? No. I don't agree with that because they don't want peace. They don't want peace, do they? I think the people probably do. I know the, vac the refugees do, but are the refugees going to get the 18 million? They can't even get the food that's being sent out for them, can they? Well, that's largely because of the way it's distributed and also largely because of the uh, the, the hazards of sniper fire and so That's forth. right. The biggest part of the food is going on the black market. So this 18 million is a waste of, a waste of money? I suggest they, they, the only thing is, is they drag out all the women and kids. See, if we were a, if we were a business, if, if the United Kingdom was a business, there's a very good argument that our accountants would be telling us we were bankrupt. Well... So can, can bankrupt businesses send £18 million pounds overseas? Well, where are they having the money from if they're, if they're, uh, if they're in the red of £50 million? Pound, where are they having the £18 million from to send? Well, um, well, no, that's the deficit, isn't it? Yeah, but it's still, they still owe eight, they still owe £50 million, don't they? Well, I think it's between 30 and £50 billion that they actually yeah. owe. Yeah, but where are they having the £18 million from? Um, Out of the pensions? Would seem so. It would seem so, Eric. It apparently appears that somehow or other that they're going to gather it out of the pensions, they're going to gather it out of a working man, uh, they're going to rob Peter to pay Paul. I mean, it would seem, wouldn't it, if you send £18 million overseas, then if, if, if you didn't send that £18 million, it would be £18 million less to find by cutting benefits. But, but they've got it... They are. If you didn't send the £18 million to Bosnia... Uh, then that'd be £18 million pounds less you'd have to cut out of social security budgets and so forth. I don't quite understand your, your answer question. Well, if you didn't send £18 million pounds to Bosnia, yeah? Yeah. When you came to look at the 
uh, readdressing the deficit. Yeah? Yeah. You wouldn't have, uh, because you've sent 18 million pounds to Bosnia, that's another 18 million pounds has to come, has to be found to Drop be in. saved from yeah. pensions, from maintenance payments, from whatever. Yeah. But if they didn't send it, they wouldn't have to bother with the pensions, would they? Ah, that's what I just said. Yeah, well. Three but, times. Uh, yeah. All right, well, that's that's one subject. That's fair enough. Now, Johnny Morris. Yes. He's got another, I reckon he's got another good subject. Should we pay pensions to millionaires? No. Why not? No. If the Queen's getting a pension, she ought to be ashamed of herself. Well, I'm not sure she was. There was any well, speculating. Well, it doesn't matter. Her might be getting one. Her mother might be getting one. And, uh... Prince Charles might be getting a uh, disabled benefit for his arm. But you can hardly see the, the Queen Mother turning up at the post office to cash a cheque for 30 or 40 quid, could you? Her don't have to turn up nowhere. Her's got, her's got Sammy's to do it, hasn't her? So servants go down and... Draw, of course they don't. Uh, I mean... But the, there again, you, you see, you're talking about the royal family. Well, they haven't actually worked all no. their lives. What, what we were talking about was millionaires who've worked and paid yeah, them to the system. Yeah, but you do it again. You take all uh, the likes of uh, these coal merchants that have got thousands and they've made their money, admit they've worked hard, right? Right. And <clears throat> you take, um, take John Major, take all them sort, if when they get to a certain age, they retire on retirement pension, don't they? Yeah. But they don't retire on sixty-eight pound a week, don't they? Well, no, but because they've been paying in for it, haven't they? Yeah, but I mean, the last people, the last people in the world I trust to look after me in my old age are the government. Well, that's very true. Very true. Unfortunately, I'm in a position where I can take out a private in, uh, pension plan. But uh, when you look at it, there, there's lots of, uh, like John said, there's uh, there's lots of old people. That's only living on a certain amount of money. I've got to make ends meet. But if somebody else, even if they're a millionaire, has paid into that scheme all their lives, they're only claiming what they're entitled to, aren't they? Well, the only thing is, I put it down, it should be ashamed to think about a pension. Unless it is a private pension. But they shouldn't claim the state pension that they're entitled to? They, no, not the state pension. I don't believe in that. Um. Because for the simple, if they've paid for a private pension, yeah, every bit, yes, they get their own private pension, yeah, they pay to it, so they, they get it back. Okie okay, dokie, listen, we've got to move on, Eric, but you, you reckon millionaires should just leave it alone and they shouldn't claim the, stem, the state pension, even if they're entitled to it? Yeah, okay. Oh, all right, then. Love you, Jackie. ta ra right. There we go, Eric. Any person in the cosmos who could gratefully accept a light and ring you up and complain about the fact. Only a matter of hours later. Who have we got next? We've got Martin. He's on this line. Good morning, Martin. Good morning, Ian. Good morning to you. What can we do you for? Well, I was fine enough, uh, coming like a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about a guy called Randy Weaver who'd um, had done a similar sort of... The FBI had done a, a Waco-style raid on his house, resulting in his wife and his child be, one, and one of his children being killed. And that um, in the sort of the ensuing fight, two FBI officers, uh, one FBI officer and a sheriff had got shot. And so, of course, they said, um, right, we're charging you with murder and um, that's it. We're taking you to prison. And the upshot of it is that after I think the jury was out for about 10 or 12 days and uh, he's been found not guilty, which struck me as in rather, you know, quite an interesting development. Did he? He didn't deny shooting them? No, he said, yeah, we did it. We did it. They were shooting at us, so we shot at them. And apparently the, some of the evidence was a bit suspect, and it turned out that um, the witnesses from the prosecution kept contradicting themselves, and um, it turned out that um, if their evidence was true, what they'd done was they'd actually shot someone in the back and um, used a sniper fire to kill a woman holding a bit, carrying a, sort of a nine-month-old baby in her arms, which seems to say that... Well, know, that, they, that opens all sorts of precedents, <laughs> doesn't it? Well, it does really. Basically, if um, so, if the police come round and start shooting at you, you've got you've got a perfect right to shoot back at them. In America, yeah, apparently, if they don't, well, if they don't follow certain procedures, apparently they were on the guy's land illegally in the first place. And it appears that the thing at Waco was a sort of follow-on from that. That maybe they were 
and perhaps the fire started because they thought well, we don't want any survivors to come and say what you know to uh to give any evidence against us so we decided you know destroy the evidence and get rid of all the people who could complain against us so that was a cover-up well probably to cover up the fact that they were acting illegally yeah because it seems a bit strange the other night i mean it seems a bit strange you've got a bunch of kids in a you were trying to say you knew actually machine gun them to death with a helicopter gunship it all seems a little bit uh, extreme bit, well extreme so i mean is they do seem to be having a lot of problems in america at the moment and it doesn't appear to matter who's the who the president is have they got too much freedom um can you ever have too much freedom i think you can do but i think maybe the problem is that the government is actually perhaps they're developing into a police state I mean, are we seeing what happened in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, where one day people wake up and say, well, stone me, we've got a police state here, what's going on? And perhaps it creeps up on people unawares, because... I, I don't see how you can say you've got a police state if people are strangely being let off for shooting policemen. Well, perhaps it's possible to argue sort of an, an aberration, because that the police seem to have been, the FBI, the sort of the, the, sort of the national police force, seems to be acting in very strange ways sort of arbitrarily shooting people and raiding doctor's offices because the you know, happens to be prescribing vitamins and um, burning 90 people to death just because they don't, <laughs> they don't seem to like their views. Well, no, they, did, they had open fire, didn't they? I'll tell you what, just hang on there. We'll continue this after the news at 1 on Beacon and WABC's Midnight Live. 754-123 in Wolverhampton, 236-235 in Shrewsbury. It's a free-for-all. What means... That you can talk about absolutely anything you wish. You can resurrect any of the subjects from the past week or discover your own subjects. It's as broad as your own imagination. We'll be back after this. The one o'clock news. This is Sarah Lockett. The Bosnian capital, Sarajevo, is still tense after a mortar bomb attack killed 12 people queuing for water at communal pumps. There's no running water or electricity, but Bosnian Serbs and Muslims have agreed to guarantee the safety of UN personnel trying to restore services. Silvana Foe of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees says she hopes both sides stick to the deal. Their promises usually aren't worth the paper they're written on. We can only hope this time there are many, many Serbs living in Sarajevo. It's a mixed city. And what's happening to the Muslims there is also happening to the Serbs. So people are going to begin to die in that city. The government is breathing a sigh of relief this morning after narrowly surviving a backbench Commons revolt over its decision to impose VAT on household fuel. It was approved by just eight votes after three Tories voted against the move. One of them, MP Nicholas Winterton, says the policy may cost the party more than the Christchurch by-election. I feel that this issue is so serious that if the government, as it uh, appears, are determined to implement the extension of VAT to domestic heat and light, I believe it could lead to the defeat of the Conservative Party at the next general election. Manchester appears to have lost out to Sydney in the race to stage the Olympics in the year 2000, according to an Olympic Committee report. The report says Manchester's proposals are good, but Sydney's are exceptional. A fresh attempt will be made today to resolve the thorny issue of Sunday trading. The government is to publish a draft bill setting out a series of options ranging from total deregulation to limited opening. MPs are expected to have a free vote on the issue later this year. Director of the Shopping Hours Reform Council, Roger Bowden, believes a compromise formula will be reached. There are many people who want to see Sunday kept a bit different from the rest of the week. And there's a sort of feel that don't let Sunday become like Saturday. And so we always argued, therefore, if you let the little shop have total freedom and restricted the larger shop to a set number of hours, that would be a way of making Sunday quite different from the rest of the week. Independent Radio News. The latest satellite picture is produced by John Warner from Orbital Station Meteosat 4. The most accurate forecast. Fine and cool overnight with a low of 5 Celsius, 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Sunny at first in the morning with rain spreading from the southwest later in the day. Slightly warmer at 19 Celsius, 66 degrees Fahrenheit. The outlook for Wednesday and Thursday, warmer with occasional rain. Temperature now 8 Celsius, 46 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Midnight Line on Beacon and WABC. Before we went to the news, we was talking to Martin. We'll go back to Martin in a moment. First of all, though, article on the news just in there was um, this thing about Sunday opening and whether or not Sunday should be a special day. I actually, it's only personal belief, but I actually believe that. that why? 
Why is my well? It used to be my day off, but I work now. But when I finish, when I finish work at two o'clock, I mean anybody else was working till two o'clock Monday to, through Saturday. They could go for a beer, couldn't they? Well, I can as well, as long as I'm out of the pub by ten to three. And it, it's always annoyed me that Sunday somehow is treated as a separate day. To me, it's just a day where I go to work. And I expect all the other services that you can get Monday through Saturday. But somehow you can't get them. Why should Sunday be kept special? 754 123 in Wolverhampton, 236 235 in Shrewsbury. Martin. Oh, hello again. Hello again. Yeah. How, how, how can it be becoming a police state? Well, there appears to be a lot of uh, oppress, very oppressive actions. Uh, against sort of individuals in in in, in but America. these are individuals who towed guns. Not necessarily. I mean, there's been cases where there's been cases where you know a, a doctor's surgeries have been raided because the doctors have actually been prescribing people vitamins, and this does appear to be a little bit excessive. But you know, our machine gun toting federal agents decide descending on on doctor's surgeries and threatening people to be that they be shot if they dared phone you know trying to make a phone call. And little, you know, little things like that. And of course, the problem is with the states is that everybody has a constitutional right to bear arms, which is a totally ludicrous idea. But um, bearing that in mind, finding someone who doesn't tote a gun in America is quite a rarity. It's you know, it's well, it's something that they fiercely defend. It but, is. But as far as the Waco siege goes, or Waco siege, or whatever you want to call it, surely it's a question of if you fly with the crows, you get shot at. Um, well, yes. Yes, but apparently it all turns out now that it was all a dreadful mistake and they're very sorry, but of course there weren't actually any illegal guns there, but ha-ha, anyone can make a mistake. Sort of, you know, it, it appears... Well, then, if there were no illegal guns there, then why did the followers of that particular sect open fire? Apparently, well, from looking at some of the videotapes, it's, it's very... It's not certain as to who actually opened fire first. I mean, you don't go into a place with a helicopter gunship if you just want to say, "Excuse me, can we look at your, you know, your gun licences?" Did they go in with a helicopter gunship originally? I think they, yeah, I think, I think they did actually, because they went in with an armed SWAT team, which actually sort of repelled down from helicopters. And I mean, what kind of lunatic would do? What, you know, what kind of lunatic would do that? It appears an American lunatic. It, exactly, but unfortunately, it appears that if you've got a, lunatics in positions of authority, actually in you know, within their Federal Bureau of Investigation, you have got serious problems. And if you've got a, nut, a nutcase who runs a little church somewhere with a, a group of followers, you can sort of ignore them or take legal action against them. But if you've got a lunatic who's in charge of a squad of highly armed, highly sort of highly armed um, but ill-trained federal agents, then you've got a lot of trouble. And this is, appears to be the problem having in America. But... Um, uh, well, it's the, it's the equivalent of the West Mercia and the West Midland Police Constabulary having uh, tanks. I mean, it's not a bad idea. What, that. Ki what kind of when you have when you have to have your own sort of local police forces armed with tanks to take action against the, your own citizens? It, I mean, you know, you are really in in, this, in a very serious situation because you've alienated the police force. Well, exactly. I mean, putting people in tanks. I mean, I could. Like, you know, police cars, yes, but tanks? I mean, God, you know, give me a break. This is getting, a bit, he's getting very, very serious. I was reading a book at the weekend all about the, the origins of the police force and how the middle class um, basically started to lose respect for the police force, largely after the 1961 CND um, protest marches, where they were handled very, very roughly. Yeah. Yes, it's um, that kind of thing can cause a problem. I think that uh, I think that perhaps in in the states now. I mean, obviously the jury must have deliberated. Excuse me, deliberated long and hard because it took him about what ten days to come to a decision with this, this Randy Weaver. I mean, whether this, whether he he was a um, a right winger or or whatever, uh, it still doesn't really give people the right to go and start shooting him and his family. And it's. It appears, really, they're getting into a situation in America where you've got to say, well, who is actually supposed to be policing the police if they're getting to the stage where they think they can go in and um, start shooting at, at anybody? But the, traditionally, the FBI always have, haven't they? Uh, yes, but it appears to be getting worse. I mean, were Bonnie and Clyde given a trial? No. This is true. Plus, also, there's the... Uh, I mean, John Dillinger as well, but I think that the problem is that the situation is getting worse now because they are perhaps seeing ordinary citizens as the enemy and what they're doing is instead of being it's almost as if they're an army of occupation because um, 
using tanks. Obviously, the FBI owned those tanks, and they must have had those tanks at the Waco siege for you for some some years before they actually used them there. And presumably they put in a requisition for them justifying why the FBI should have tanks, exactly. which is slightly worrying. Well, yeah, this is it. But there again, America has a National Guard. Um, well, that's which, which is, is sort of like the army end of the police force, isn't sort it? Sort of. It's, it's more sort of equivalent to our, our TA, apparently. Well, so, no, not really. But because they're only allowed to operate within their own borders, I believe. I yeah, and if the works. situation... I mean, as 10CC wrote it, we don't understand why they called out the National Guard. If yes. you look after the rioting in Los Angeles when the police couldn't deal with it, who was called out? The National Guard. For a modern country, for a modern country, they do seem to have some very old-fashioned ideas because we got rid of our, our local militias about 100 years ago and they do seem to perhaps trying to... And some people would say that was a bit of a mistake. Well, perhaps it was. Well, we got the TA, you see, so, you know, more... Um, so What's happened is, in Britain, it seems to our, our armed forces have evolved to meet the sort of current situation. The militias fell away and stopped being used, but the TA took their place. But in America, they appear to be trying to operate one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world with um, very, very old-fashioned ideas, like you can have a sort of an armed militia made up of people who um, sort of only soldier once in a while, which is one of the problems they had at Kent State University back in 1970 when they just opened fire for no reason at all and shot, I think it was about 12, 15 students were killed. And I think that perhaps this kind of thing has been happening in America. So your message to America would be, beware the savage duel of 1984? Well, I think so, yeah. I think it's, it seems... It's a, it's a pity, but um, perhaps... The, uh, perhaps President Clinton can't really control things because it appears that um, he's trying to outbush President Bush with his attacks, his attacks on sort of Somalia. And I really wonder if who's in, who is actually in control in America these days. Probably the FBI. Listen, I'm going to move on, mate. Okay, thanks Speak to you soon. Okay, thanks. Ta -ra. Bye. 754-123 in Wolverhampton, 236-235 in Shrewsbury. It's the Midnight Line on Beacon and WABC. And next on the lines, with a moan, I believe, it's Wayne. Good morning. Yeah, hello. Hello, and another first-time caller to first, meet. First-time caller, you socialist. Me? Yeah, that's you, you lefty. What about it, righty? <laughs> Sorry, not quite. Um, All right, middly. <laughs> no, not that neither. Well, um, what are you then? Um, uh, myself, an individual. All right, individual. Okay, then. Start accusing me of being left. <laughs> You'd actually be quite amazed if you knew how right winger was. Go on, else. then. Get your two pence in. What can we do for you, then? Yeah, I'd just like to talk about unemployment, really. Are you unemployed? Yeah, currently, yeah. And, um, uh, among, among the young people, it's like unemployment is, like, sky high. And, uh, basically, if you've got... Thousands and thousands of young people with nothing to do. You know, they can resort to antisocial behaviour, i.e. crime, drugs, that sort of stuff. Why? Um, because they didn't in the uh, in the 1930s depression. No, they just got drunk 15 pints of whiskey or lager and then that was it, wasn't it, really? Well, they didn't have lager in the 1930s, but... And they certainly couldn't afford whiskey, but surely the the problem is that that young people are always going to be bottom of the unemploy of, of the employment heap because they don't have any experience. No, I think really, speaking for myself, I've got a criminal record, and most people I know have got a criminal record. Why did you get your criminal record? Uh, basically, uh, I don't know. I left care, went burgling, and that was it, really. The uh, down and down road to uh, criminalisation. But from there, you have to carry on and you go one way or the other. And uh, luckily, I went the right way. I went to college. But if you're unlucky, you go the other way and go on to YC, then Winds and Green and whatever. So, how, how far down the, the judicial system did? Did you traipse? I mean, magistrate's court or...? Crown court. Went to Crown court. Did yeah. you ever get a custodial sentence? I've had three. What made you want to burgle? Well, I couldn't get a job. I had my friends with me, and somehow you, you've got to make money. You've got to do something. So that was it, really. But what, why did you go burgling when most people would just go down the DHSS or the DSS or whatever they call themselves these days and just sign on? <laughs> because you can't. I was under 18 at the time. So legally, 
as I was like 17 at the time, you cannot sign on legally. So, you know, you have to explore other options. And for you, that other option was burglary? Yeah, I, I feel bad about it, but, you know, I've paid my price. Why did you stop it? What Why? made you want to stop, yeah? Because, basically, I realised that, you know, if you go burgling, you go stealing, the law of averages is you're going to get caught eventually, yeah? Yeah. So I suppose that stopped me. And so prison was, in f was or did act as a deterrent? You didn't want to go back to it? I don't think it's a deterrent at all. On the other, on the other side of the coin, I've got my brother, who's 24, and to him, prison is like um, an occupational hazard. But to me, it's like... I don't want nothing to do with it. So you want to stay on the straight and narrow. Do you oh. find that, do you find that easy? No, not really. No. But you know, at the end of the day, if you go out burgling and stealing and whatever else, you're gonna let yourself down, and then you know it goes down from there, don't it? So what, what finally reformed you then? When did you finally reach these conclusions? Well, I was, I was brought up in care and uh, I stayed in touch with a residential social worker and I stayed out of trouble for about two years and then this residential social worker offered me somewhere to live so I moved in and then went to college. Because statistics out yesterday showed that over the past 12 months, 50,000 homes have been burgled yeah. in the last year, and 50,000 businesses. That's 100,000 burglaries, and that's just in the West Midlands, well, in the Midlands. Yeah. That's a lot of burglaries. Well, no, but to tell the truth, I don't think a lot of them burglaries are carried out by young people, as the government and various agencies claim. So who's doing it? I don't know, older people, I suppose. It just gets blamed on younger people. I know they've obviously got their fair share of crime, but it's not all us, you know. It's not, I don't know, um, a trend or whatever. Yeah, I, I think that's that's part of the tradition, isn't it, of being young? I mean, when I was young, it, people always referred to us as hooligans because we had short hair yeah. and, and wore drain pipes and were punks. You know, immediately, because you're young, you're a hooligan. But I think every generation does that. I know, but before you thought, I don't know, I suppose government, what I think anyway, is a lie about crime stats. But if you can solve crime, you've got to sort out the social problems. And, like, no one seems to have, like, um, how do I say it? Any idea what they're doing? No. They've got the idea... But they don't really want to do anything about it. They'd rather waffle on about something else than sort the problem out at its roots. So if you'd have had, like, a middle-class upbringing, you'd just gone directly to college, and you, you reckon you wouldn't have got involved in burglary? You're damn right. I'd have no need, would I? I could just, like, go from A to B, C to D, D to E. What did you spend the money on? Um, taxis, restaurants, stuff like that, drugs, even. So you, you basically spent the proceeds... Blew it. But you spent it on, on, it seems to me, living the sort of life that tabloid newspapers tell you that you should lead. Yeah, exactly. But at the end of the day, after you've spent all that money and you've got nicked, and you're in a police station thinking, oh my God, what am I doing here? After about six, seven, five time you walk out, you think, oh, forget this. And if you're lucky, you find something worth doing. Which fortunately you did. Yeah. You know. So how long have you got to go to college now? Well, I start September again full time at Stairbridge. So uh, hopefully I'll follow on from there. Do you believe that it's true that, I mean, the, the Thatcher's theory the, of the 80s was that ultimately wealth would trickle down into the rest of society? Total right? crap. Well, yeah, obviously. But I, I would say that what actually happened during the, the mid to late 80s is that successive economic policies based on greed 
actually created an underclass with absolutely no hope whatsoever. I agree. So what you basically got is you've got your, your upper class, the knobs, the middle class, and you've got your working class in work, and then underneath all that, right at the bottom of the pile, underclass. you've got an underclass. And the underclass don't actually live in society, they live outside society, but they are allowed to look at society through a window, but they're not actually allowed in to, to join in and have some of the goodies. Well, I don't know. The only, the only way that they can get in is to break the window. No, I wouldn't agree. The thing is, what I think personally... When you had no money, though, weren't there, like, loads of, uh, loads of television commercials, adverts in... It does get to you. Exactly. That, it, it's society saying, hey, look at all the goodies you can have, except you lot can't have them, um, because... The media got work for you. has got a part to play, really. Because, you know, the, the adverts, whatever else, they get on top of you, and, like, you're skinned, your friend knocks the door, got a car outside, I know a yard to do, and you go and do it, don't you? And at the end of the day, you got a bit of money in your pocket, and then you're looking over your shoulder, fingerprints, forensic, whatever. And if you get caught, you're unlucky. If you get away, then you're lucky. But you're still looking over your shoulder. And you reckon, uh, statistically, you're on borrowed time anyway? Yeah, of course you are. I'd be stupid not to think that. Sooner or later, you're going to get nicked. Listen, thanks for that. That was interesting. Um, <laughs> stay on the straight and narrow, that's all I can that's say, cool. Wayne. Oh, well. Good luck with the course. Good night, you psychologist. Good night, you um, <laughs> student. <laughs> Bye. ta -ra. There we go. Wayne. Wayne said that he took to a life of crime because he had absolutely no opportunities whatsoever. He said boredom led to it. The fact he didn't have any money led to it. When he got the money from his criminal exploits, he spent it on basically having a lifestyle that a lot of people just take for granted. 50,000 homes burgled in the Midlands last year. 50,000 businesses burgled as well. That means there's a lot of victims of burglary knocking around. We had Wayne. Wayne was a self-confessed burglar. He told you why he did it. If you've given up, or maybe you, you still bill the burglar, then we'd like to talk to you. If you bill the burglar, we want to talk to you. If you used to be bill the burglar, we want to talk to you. Also, if you are the victim of a burglary, how did it make you feel? Were you happy with the uh, with the results? Were you happy with the attention that was paid to you? Did you get a fair deal, do you think? 754-123 in Wolverhampton, 236-235 in Shrewsbury. And if you've been the victim of a burglary or not, do you have any sympathy with what Wayne was saying? It is a free-for-all, I say you can talk about anything you want to talk about. Once again, 754-123 in Wolverhampton, 236-235 in Shrewsbury. We've got Boris on the lines, we've also got Pauline. We'll speak to them after we've had it. Featured CD artiste this morning, Paul McCartney from the CD. Paul McCartney, imaginatively named, still no worse than the Midnight Line, I suppose, which starts, strangely enough, at midnight. And off that CD, it was seeming jolly good tune as well. It's Beacon and WABC. It's the Midnight Line, and next on the line, da 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 da, da Boris. Hello. Hello, Boris. Good evening, how are you? Welcome, boris <laughs> that's, want... that's right, that, isn't it? In Eastern Europe, everybody, if I lived in Eastern Europe, I'd be called Ian Ski. Um, and you'd be Borisky. <laughs> and if you were called Anne, you'd be Ansky. Ansky. Oh. And the, the only bit of my theory that, um, well, the only bit part where my theory falls down is Joe Stalin. <laughs> but he didn't have to be called Ski because he was the leader. <laughs> so he said he wasn't being called Ski. Oh. Uh, um, do you know what it means, Ski? Um, I haven't a clue. No, neither do I. Um, I'll try and find out. Anglovich is son of England, I know that. Oh. So I'd be Ian of no, I'd be I'd be Williamovich, son of William. I know what Boris means. What's we going then? What's Boris means? Because I used to have a spider called Boris. I know that's what I'm going to moan about, but uh, no, Boris means it's a brave Russian warrior. I suppose it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Saying there goes that brave Russian warrior when you could just say there goes Boris. Well, that's it. Just makes life a bit easier, doesn't it? <laughs> really. No, but. Um, what I want to moan about yes. is why you... Me? Yes. Ian? Yes. And everybody else calls the spiders Boris. Well, I actually called mine Boris from a John Entwistle song. J not a David Barry one? David Barry falling to earth and all <laughs> sorts of things like that. No. No. I called it after Boris the Spider by John uh, Entwistle. Ooh. 
Yeah, that's where I got mine from. Uh, I, I realise it's very unimaginative, and I stand accused of being very unimaginative. I don't know, I think, well, even on the TV programmes, on Central News and all that, and they have the spites on, they're all called Boris. And it really annoys me. Because you're called Boris as well? Yes. I mean, you have all the mickey-taking and that, but... But didn't, do you not tell them? Do you not tell them that Boris means noble Russian warrior? No. No. Oh. No. Why, because they take the mickey even more then, yeah. really, wouldn't they? <laughs> well... Hey, I'm... up here comes the noble Russian warrior. <laughs> That's it. Yes, I understand that. That's fair enough. Where well, do you want me to rename him, then? Yeah, please. Well, I can't, because he's history now. He's a part of my history. Well, put a second I... name in, then. All right. The Spider. <laughs> Boris The Spider. I suppose on that basis I'd be Ian the radio presenter, wouldn't I? Well, why not? And you'd be not? Boris the caller. <laughs> um, can I just say something about the last caller? Yes. Yes. Um, about him being a criminal or whatever. An ex-criminal, yeah? Yeah, ex-criminal. Um, I had my, uh, my car, the petrol pipe, cut on it about five times outside my house and phoned up the police. And they come round and they just done no good at all. So in the end, I changed my car. A little extreme, isn't it? Well, no, because they weren't going to do anything about it. What can you do? What did you want to see done? Um, I don't think they could have done anything. I think it was up to me to do something about it. So I just changed the car so they couldn't. Well, you um, had one without a petrol tank. No, I had one where they they couldn't crawl under and, like, cut the petrol pipe so easily. Oh, they cut the petrol pipe to your engine? Yeah. What are they going to do that for? Train the petrol. I had a full tank at one time, and they must have only had a gallon. And they left the rest of it just to drain down the road. There was an incident, uh, it's going back about three months now. Why do these things always happen shortly before you arrive? But I arrived at my girlfriend's and um, her car, had, they'd forced the, the lock on the petrol cap. And they'd only taken like a couple of pints. And we came to the conclusion it was probably teenagers who were sniffing yeah. petrol. But some people say there's no justice because two weeks later, there was a, a story in the Star mm. about some teenagers who set fire to the heads. Mm -hmm. While they were trying to sniff petrol. You know, one of them decided to have yeah. a fag while he was doing it. You know, a real bright one amongst <laughs> them. And I thought, there is a God. <laughs> there probably is a God. Mm, but the first time, like, with the full tank of petrol, I called the police and the police come. And there was petrol all over the road and it was going down the drain. And all I said was, they advised me to move the car and get lots of water. I'd like to pour it down because we don't want to call a fire brigade why were they on a tea break no because it costs too much and i'm thinking yeah you know, if someone comes along and like with a cigarette and a hey, carelessly discarded cigarette yeah um well you don't know i mean with kids and that round here i mean you don't know and they all start barking well well they go woof <laughs> that's it but, um, say in the end, I'll just change the car. Why should you have to do that, though? Um, because I couldn't afford the petrol. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Listen, Boris, we've got to move on, mate. Yep. Well, thanks for that, and we're very sorry everybody associates you with spiders. I know. Despite the fact spiders are actually noble beasts and nearly as fascinating as ants. <laughs> ants are really... Get a watch out. Programmes about ants are really great. Because they're like, I bet you didn't know what vicious little creeps they all are. Oh, I know. I've, I've seen a few programmes. Nasty little things, your yeah. ants. I think if I'm reincarnated, I want to come back as an ant. Well, I'm going to come back as a spider, so I'm <laughs> going to haunt you all. <laughs> and we'll definitely call you Boris then, all right, Boris? OK, good night. Good night. Boris, not the spider, on Beacon and WABC's Midnight Line. Who have we got next? Uh, which list am I meant to be looking at? This one here. We've got Pauline next. Good morning, Pauline. How are you? Good morning. What can we do you for? Uh, I rang you about uh, what I read in the paper the other night about the uh, council saying property for a pound. Uh, you did indeed. Uh, How many have you bought? I'll have a dozen. <laughs> As long as Actually, they take a check. Uh, I've heard it is uh, run down property, right? 
and selling the property of a pound in the black country music, uh, black country people are um, tr- going to do them up apparently. So I don't know what them playing at, you know, they're proper monkeys, aren't they? From the monkey house? <laughs> well, yeah. is, it, is it a good or a bad idea, do you think, now? Actually, it is. If the, if the place is in a very bad state repair, such as uh, after a fire, I don't think it would be worth doing up, would you? Then why, so the, the selling it to some mug for a quid? Oh, I think them just trying to get out of doing the property, actually. Well, we have a situation. Uh, we have a situation where more people want council houses than we actually have, and we're not building any. Oh, true. But I was thinking if they could, um, they couldn't flatten them. But why don't they uh, just do them up and rent them a little bit cheaply than what they could normal? Because it hasn't got a roof and things like that. You can have this one's going cheap because it hasn't got a roof or any windows. <laughs> Silly Looks a bit like a cardboard box to me. Yes, a lot of people have remarked <laughs> upon that. Do you think um, we ought to have council houses? Pardon? Do you think we ought to have council houses? I think we should, really, because there's a lot of people that need, need houses that uh, cannot get out to flats like I did, for instance. So I had uh, a, th- a two-bedroom flat just up the way here, and uh, I had to come out on the health grounds owing to... Uh, my sciatic back and that put me in a three-storey block of flats. Well, that's useful for a sciatic back, isn't it? Oh, well, it wasn't doing me much good and I had to have a liver operation at the time. And uh, I had to come out and I'm in a, a ground floor at the moment. And also I've got a moan about him. They're very slow with repairing. Who, the council are? Oh, very slow down here. The monkey house? Well, what, what haven't they repaired? Well... I've been waiting for a, a new toilet for about three months. What's wrong with the one you got? Actually, it's leaking. Oh, lovely. <laughs> it's leaking. Lovely. You're a health hazard, you are. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm talking to... it's clean, actually. It's coming out. I'm talking to a health hazard live on the wireless. <laughs> so what, what happens then? Because I've never lived in, in council property. What do you do? Do you ring them up and say, come round and fix me toilet? Well, apparently down, down this area in Tipton, we, we have to go to the local area, which is down the bottom end, and uh, we have to report it there or phone them up. So you, you duly reported it? Yes, my husband has to go there. Cause I can't...